Welcome to Talking Jazz. My guest today is pianist, composer, and educator Chris Davis. And I'm so happy to have her. Hi, Chris. Hello. Thanks for having me. We're going to talk about some really interesting music uh, that Chris put out over the last decade and that opens up our horizons on how we think and perceive about jazz. But, you know, we should start a little bit with your background. Where do you come from and how did you get into piano playing? Well, I'm originally from Calgary, Canada, and I started playing piano when I was six. I started playing classical music. I guess a couple of years later, I wanted to quit because I felt like it was a lonely existence, Bach and Mozart and, and all of that. But when I got into middle school, I joined the jazz band and there was a really great teacher there and in Kevin Wilms and was supportive of, of all of us using the band room for you know our needs as young budding musicians and he just loved jazz and so he'd play records for us and give us CDs to take home and you know tell us kind of direct us into what tunes we should learn and and just encourage us to play and explore so I think from that mentality we kind of took the ball and, and ran with it there were some young musicians we would get together every weekend and we'd play tunes from the real book and listen to recordings and go to the jam sessions on the weekend and yeah it was all things jazz actually like fairly quickly i decided that i wanted to get into jazz and be a jazz musician for my career when i was about 13. i just loved the the freedom of it i love the community of it i loved, liked working towards a common goal with the artists i was playing with and i just felt there was a lot of room for growth and a lot to discover and so that's kind of how it started you know and that's a really good point that we see that often in careers that there's this key figure who makes things available and who just provides the avenue and the resources to do it and how important that is to, to having that space and having that opportunity. Definitely. Yeah. I think you and I were both doing these workshops in Calgary. You were remote, but I was in person last weekend. We were talking a little bit about jazz and gender and how some of the teachers that I had and, and myself and Christine Jensen, both of our teachers never told us that it would be difficult as a woman to play this music. They were just like, you know, go for it. And, you know, focused on the music. I think that's one of the main reasons, you know, we both kept with it and felt like there was a space for us in the music. Making making space at the table. Yeah, you're right. And then eventually you got to New York and made lots of great music. <laughs> now you got to Boston. I, do you live in New York now or in Boston or? I'm in Boston. I lived in New York for 20 years and moved to Boston last year when I started. Well, I was already teaching at the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice. Um, and just after the pandemic, I moved um, permanently up to Boston. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about background, but that first tune that we're going to listen to, the Symponial Sunflower, features your colleague at the Institute or the one who founded it, Terry Lynn Carrington on the drums. That album was in the New York Times, the number one album of 2019, which which means a lot. And a lot of the best off list of 2019, and it, it climbed to the top. It's really interesting. Well, first you have to explain to us what a symposial sunflower is, but the whole idea of these science themes behind it, <laughs> give us a little <laughs> glimpse there. Well, I usually name compositions after they're done. But yeah, I was really into this documentary about diatoms and how when you see them the album's called diatom ribbon so when you see diatoms feeding in the oceans from space you, they create these kind of green ribbons in the in the ocean I just thought oh that's a really cool image maybe i'm gonna name the record after that and so then of course like you said it started a science theme and i i don't totally remember what all these names are i think sympodial is like the growth of you know the branches of the tree so it's kind of this thing that well, like a spiral, you know, it can, it has the strength of the original branch and then things grow, the pieces, you know, extra branches grow off of it. So that's really the, the name of, you know, why, I don't know, it's not really related to the music in any way, but I thought it was a nice title. And No, but I, I can see the relationships and how things unfold in un, unknown ways and un, in natural ways. You know, it sounds a little bit like Ama Jamal going to space, I think. Cool. I'm going to take that as a compliment. Well, you know, it's got, got some Amat Jamal grooves, but 
yeah and you're moving right along <laughs> absolutely that was terry's contribution you know like i try not to prescribe too much for the drums when i started playing the piece that's the first thing she heard so so much of of what i do you know is a, a framework that i bring in and it's so much a collaboration with the other players that you know i'm working with that's why we got into jazz right to have yeah. that to not be lonely in the practice room with your classical piano <laughs> exactly <laughs> well let's have a listen so this is symposial sunflower featuring Terilyn carrington and of course my guest today chris davis from the album Diatom Ribbons 2019 release on Pyroclastic Records. That was Sympodio Sunflower, a selection from the album Diatome Ribbons, and uh, featuring my guest today, Chris Davis, who you heard on piano, and who's also the composer. And we're going to dig in a little bit more into this album. We'll have the 
hard rock version of Golgi Complex coming up soon. But I, I wanted to ask you a little bit. I mean, we hinted that you bring in frameworks, but about this composition process, because it's, it's very unusual frameworks that you're bringing in. Yeah, well, this this piece actually it appears twice on the album in two totally different flavors. The first version it's kind of a chaos version. <laughs> the instruction was to create, you know, a kind of a high energy track where everyone is improvising, but the melody is the the thing that's soaring over top of this chaos. And the task is to try to keep that kind of intensity going throughout the piece as the melody unfolds. So the melody's out of time and everyone's playing around and interacting and finding different things to grab onto. So that's the track we're not gonna listen to. <laughs> we're gonna listen to the, the sequel, I called it, which is sort of like a funky, groovy version of the tune. It features Mark Rebo on guitar and of course, Terry Lynn Carrington on the drums um, and Chess Smith on vibes and Trevor Dunn on bass. Actually, I'm not sure if Chess is on this one, <laughs> but I wrote this sequel for them, you know, just thinking of the players in mind on this track and, you know, how Mark's just so good at you know, grooving, but also like exploring the space and sort of sustaining this level of, I don't know, interesting lines and intensity and just hearing his sound. So that was the, the impetus for this track. Super intense. The guitar takes over and then takes us to two places. But that's really interesting. Also, you know, thinking about how tunes take on different lives, you know, same tune. And then you put it in different context and it becomes a whole new animal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, as a, as an educator, this is something I do with my students a lot where they'll bring in a melody and then we try to find three or different way, three or four different ways, play the tune just based on, you know, descriptions or ideas, not necessarily writing, you know, a form, but how could we just create a form in the moment, take it from there. So I guess it was also kind of in conversation with my you know, teaching pedagogy practices uh, as an educator too. That's really cool. I'll come to your class sometime. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> like fun. Over. Well, let's have a listen. This is the Golgi Complex and it's from the same album that was the 2019 best album according to the New York Times, Diatom Ribbons, and of course um, by my guest today, Chris Davis, featuring Mark Bribo on the guitar. Thank you. 
That was Golgi Complex, a selection from the album Diatom Ribbons by my guest today, Chris Davis, who you also heard on piano. And we talked a little bit about composing and about your background. 
but I think we should also talk about this Berkeley Institute and your partnership with Tara Lynn Carrington that you have had for several years now. How did it come about? And, and tell us a little bit about the Institute. Well, Terry reached out to me through email, I think around 2017 or 18, and just said, hey, I'm a fan. And of course, I saw her email and I was like, oh my God, I'm a fan. <laughs> You're a fan. I'm a fan. So I wrote her back, you know, and, and told her, of course, and then she asked me to to come and play a show in Taipei with Linda O oh and Val Genti. And so I met some of her, you know, kind of close collaborators for this performance in Taipei. And then um, shortly after the great pianist Jerry Allen passed away and uh, Terry wanted to create some tribute concerts to her. And so she asked me to play on um, a bunch of those. And then around that time, I also had a week at the Stone, a residency at the Stone where you know, we do kind of more experimental things in jazz <laughs> sometimes. It's a space for that, trying trying new things. And so I asked Terry and Val Genti to come and play an improvised set of music. And I think that was the first time Terry had ever played a whole set of improvised music. And it was a very, very special, memorable concert. And it was a performance that made me want to make this record, Diatom Ribbons. And then I guess shortly after that, Terry was starting the Institute at Berkeley, um, Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice, mainly because she was hearing stories about students that were having a hard time in institutions, being treated badly, being treated unfairly, specifically women um, and non-binary students. And so she wanted to create a safe space for those students within Berkeley. And so that's kind of how it started. I joined the Institute a year later, and she also has asked Linda Mahan O to teach and Val Genti. And each year it keeps growing. We have uh, new teachers. And last year it was Edmar Colon and then Neil Smith also joined. Um, Let us see join this year. So it's it's really, really growing, expanding, and I think we have about 80 students this semester. And Berkeley's such a big school that the institutes, there's a few institutes in Berkeley, they sort of function as micro communities within Berkeley. It's a way for students to find each other, you know, find their people and their communities and, and build something from that. And so we've seen now that the Institute's been going for about four years. That certainly happened. We have musicians are coming out of Berkeley, having met in the Institute, you know, being very uh, conscious of, of gender issues and considering that in their, you know, decision making and music making as they go forward. So it's, it's really exciting to see the impact that it's having among our students and also the just the output that the institute is having we released a real book of 101 women composers which monica you're in the book as of i um as of many many other incredible women composers and then it seems that now that book is really taking on a life of its own within institutions that are trying to create curriculums around the book and to be more inclusive in their in their programming and curriculum that they teach students. Putting that together, I think, was the most genius idea ever. <laughs> Absolutely the right thing at the right time. And yes, seeing it catch on like this. And plus, you know, don't be modest. You also recorded an album based on these tunes that's Grammy nominated now. So we're all crossing fingers because I think that would be absolute well-deserved and the right thing. Yeah, that's, that's exciting. Well, well, we'll talk more, but I think we should throw some music in because we have a really one more cool tune. This is also from the Diatom Rhythm. Yes, yep. And it features Terry Lynn again and um, Val Genti on turntables and electronics. And this piece sort of reflects my love of, of classical, contemporary classical music, specifically Messéon with this piece. And so there's elements of, of Messéon kind of broken up. There's sections where he's speaking about the his bird call pieces and kind of mm -hmm. vocalizing the birds, you know, that he tries to uh, emulate in his piano pieces. And I was listening to this podcast about memes and how like memes are like, you know, when you're eating something, it's a mouth feel and a meme is like a brain feel. <laughs> and I thought, that's so cool. Like, I want to try to incorporate, you know, my memes, the things that, you know, speak to me or that, that I find are a brain feel for me. And so I cut up different pieces of Messiaen's interview and gave that to Val. And so she's manipulating some of those vocalizations and, and descriptions that, you know, he's explaining in this inter interview. 
and then I'm using some of um, his kind of harmonic, just like loosely, you know, harmonic approaches. Some of the sounds he comes up with that, you know, I really, really like and use a lot in my improvisation approach. And I love the way you, you know, you take things from somewhere else. It's like real entrepreneurial thinking. You oh, yeah, happen to listen to a podcast and I'll <laughs> incorporate it because, you know, we find things anywhere or ideas or inspirations, you know, put them into yeah, it's, new it's ways. true. I can't stop myself. Hear something and hear the connection and want to bring it in. So true creative minds. Cool. Well, here is Corn Craig from the album Diatom Ribbons. Uh, 2019 pyroclastic records release by my guest today chris davis also featuring terry lynn carrington and val
That was Corn Craig, a selection from the album Diatom Ribbons, the best jazz album according to the New York Times of 2019. And my guest today is Chris Davis, who you heard on piano. So we'll go now and hear only piano. We'll have a solo piano piece. And, you know, I, I listened to it and those, it's just mind blowing. <laughs> those ostinatos, how you did that. And obviously you did some things to the piano too. So I, I think you need to explain to us how you put this all together so we can imagine where all these sounds come from. Well, as I mentioned in the last track, I'm really influenced by contemporary classical music. And this piece is totally connected to uh, Georgi Leggetti's piano etude, or yeah, etude number 10. I'm going to butcher this. It's in German, Der Zauberlehring, which is 10 exorcists. Um, and so that's where the title comes from. And so um, for this track, I prepared some of the piano, putting some materials in the back of the piano and the strings. So it has a similar flavor to that piece or this kind of like gamelan. The piece starts with this kind of gamelan, I don't know, section where you're kind of like overlapping hands. And I thought it would be cool to try and you know, incorporate that, but then also throw in some prepared piano. And so we hear like some percussive elements, but also some melodic and tonal elements. And so this is like a, it's an improvisation, but it has some kind of framework around it in order to produce the result that you hear. But it's you, it's not overdubbed several things. No right? overdubbing, not on this one, no. Right, <laughs> because that's that's important when when you listen to it to to realize it's, it's a lot of you know treating the piano like a percussion instrument, which it is, and which makes a lot of sense, right? Yeah, for sure. And then in the middle of the piece, there's like a, a kind of a baseline ostinato that comes in, and that's actually directly from Ligeti's etude. And it's funny because the piece originally is played very fast, and so you wouldn't hear that ostinato but of course when I was learning it super slow I heard these three bars and thought oh that'd be really cool as an ostinato so again snatching things from you know the music and just things that inspire me and trying to use them in different ways yeah I was just going to ask you how much you actually practice and learn these contemporary piano pieces then do you spend yeah regularly or how, how do you build that into your routine? Yeah, I mean, I used to practice them a lot, get scores and, you know, then I just yeah find these gems and it really informed the way that I improvise and also the way I compose. I don't do it as much now just because I don't have so much time. I'm certainly glad that I spent, you know, many years exploring and checking out scores and learning the music to the best of my ability. I never perform it in front of people, but it was just great for my own practice and and learning process. That's really cool and interesting to know. Let's dive in. This is 10 Exorcists from an album called Massive Threats. It's a 2013 Thirsty Ear recording release and it's solo prepared piano improvised by my guest today, Chris Davis. Thank you. 
that was 10 Exorcists, a solo piano piece by my guest today, Chris Davis, from her 2013 Massive Threats, Threats with a D, release. We talked about playing with titles, but before we go into this next piece, which is with your uh, trio, I wanted to ask you a little bit how you approach teaching. I mean, you hinted earlier that you're trying to get different frameworks, different mindsets. Do you actually, are, are there some basics that, you know, you think that everybody should do or give us a little bit your teaching approach? Well, you know, at Berkeley now, I'm working with so many students from all over the world and not everybody has a traditional jazz background, but there is an interest to want to improvise, to compose, to bring in elements of jazz and also maybe combine it with, you know, a student's traditional music that they were brought up playing or, you know, even classical music. And so I'm really interested in supporting those efforts through improvisation, through giving some direction for improvisation. So it might be a framework in which, you know, I ask someone to improvise something. It might be a, a composition assignment where, you know, they have to use sometimes like a, if it's, you know, pitch material, it might be something like a tone row, or it might be something specific from like a, a rhythmical exercise. And so I'll just also just bring in some of my music and some music that's inspired me and, you know, give examples. But I really want to empower students to make the music they want to make that's reflective of them. And that may not be the traditional, you know, thing that we think of as jazz at this point. Yeah, I went to the David Baker School of Learn Your Bebop Language Jazz, where, you know, you actually had your list of the essential bebop heads that you had to learn and test out on. And that's super, I mean, I'm just about learning a tradition, like whatever the tradition is, I, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, for me, like you, I was also really interested in like traditional jazz music. And so I was studying bebop and learning a lot of standards. And I'm so glad that I went through that process and it informs a lot of what my, what I do, but it's also not the only thing. Um, it's a piece of you know, the sort of bigger picture. And yeah, I just, I encourage, because I know a lot of students want to play improvised music, but that music is only going to go as deep as your knowledge of a tradition and what you can, you need the tools <laughs> in order to create something, you know, deep and meaningful. And so whatever that is to you, you know, go for it, but only do it because it, it means something, you know, it, it's inspiring to you and you're curious about it that's where it diverges from you know learning more standards and things not everybody wants to go that route and that's cool and it, but it's still to me it's still jazz it's, as long as there's a, a sense of that there's improvisation and that there's also a s desire for innovation and that's something that's guided me through my whole process as a discovering my own voice as an artist is to want to be an innovator and a contributor to the lineage of jazz yeah it's a really important point you know in order for it to be a living music there has to be a way forward so if we keep looking backwards and teaching what's what's in the back you know we're not enabling to make it live and go forward <laughs> yeah exactly looking back but also looking forward and it means all the composers and you know players that we think of like Thelonious Monk or Herbie Hancock, Wayne Shorter, you know go down the list they were all innovators they were looking back but they were also looking forward so mm -hmm. I think that's you know an important thing to remember for students that are uh, getting into into the music. You know we just have so much to look back on right now <laughs> that it gets overwhelming in a lot. <laughs> They had so a little true. less. Where does that tunnel go? Or what are we listening for? Give us a quick glimpse on, on this piece. Well, it's funny you asked me about teaching because this actually this piece was in response to one of my students' pieces who was trying to understand what makes a good melody. I was trying to explain that even if something are in two different keys at the same time, if you repeat it, you know, if there's like a harmonic or a melodic rhythm to it and you repeat it, it can, it can work and it can be a strong melody. And so this is, this piece was in response to that where the right hand is kind of, you know, on the black keys and the left hand on the white keys. And there's some kind of harmonic movement in the left hand. Well, let's check it out. Here is Where Does That Tunnel Go? This is from an album called Good Citizen and features uh, John Hebert. 
John A. Bieber and Tom Rainey, 2010 Fresh Sound Records, released by my guest today, Chris Davis.
does that tunnel go? A piece from the album Good Citizen by my guest today, Chris Davis, who you also heard on piano. So we got one last one. That was really fun. I'm, I'm so glad we made this happen, Chris. It's great to be here. Absolutely. So the big news, of course, is, you know, you just got a Grammy nomination, that standards project, the books were sold out in a day. I assume they get reprinted. I hope so. <laughs> lots of lots more editions. What's next? Is is there some plans or for this project or for, for the institute or for you? What, what's next? Well, next I have an album, a live album coming out from the Village Vanguard. We recorded last year, or I guess in May, so this year, but it'll come out next year. Terry Lanigan and Val Genti and Trevor Dunn. All the original people from the first record, I, Tom Rivens, um, plus Julian Lodge on guitar. So that'll be coming out sometime next year. And then I'm also working on a book to work on just like rethinking curriculum for like introduction to jazz. So I'm working on that now and it should be coming out through, well, through the Institute. I don't exactly know quite yet who will be distributing it, but that's what I'm working on now and hoping to get out you know, at some point next year. Oh, I'll, I'll definitely look for that. That sounds fascinating. Fascinating. So all these great ideas that you just shared. I don't have to come to Berkeley. I can buy the book. And with the 101 standards, are, is there going to be volume two of the recordings of the book? I think definitely recording wise, there'll be volume two, three, four, five up to but, 10. I think Terry's hoping that someone will, you know, take the baton and, uh, you know, do the next version of the, the book because there's certainly many more composers to include and pieces to include. It was a lot of work. It took us three years and a lot of, a lot of moving parts. So I'm glad it's finally out. And so this last one, Pass the Magic Hat. What's the magic hat? <laughs> Which magic are we going to expect here? Living in New York for 20 years and playing these little clubs there was always, I mean, for, I don't know if it's like that now, but for a period, there was this situation where you would pass the hat and hope some people put some money in it, and that's how you got paid. And I just, I always hated that, <laughs> that process. And so I guess I was making, poking a little fun at, at uh, that situation with this title here. So this one has a cool lineup with Matt Maneri, Ingrid Laubrock, and Trevor Dunn, and Tom Rainey. Thanks again, Chris, for, for joining us and sharing all these cool bits of information and sharing your music with us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Monica. It's great to connect. Pass the Magic Hat, a 2013 release entitled Capricorn Climber by my guest today, Chris Davis. Thank you. Thank you.
Today was pianist, composer, and educator Chris Davis. You can hear Talking Jazz every Thursday at 11 a.m. and Mondays at 7 p.m. on WETF 105.7 in South Bend, Indiana, or online at jazzradiowetf.org, and Fridays at 8 p.m. on WICR. 88.7 Indianapolis. Previous shows are also on my YouTube channel, Monica Hersig, M O N I K A H E R Z I G. Please subscribe to the Talking Jazz playlist. Thank you for listening. <laughs>